uh, be titled Plasma Bubble and Blob Events in the F Region Ionosphere by uh, Sovet at uh, New Jersey Institute of Technology. So if you want to go ahead and share your screen and, and do whatever you want to do, that it's up to you now. So can you hear me okay? Yes, we hear yeah. you fine. Yeah. And how about the screen? My poster. Yep, we see the poster too. So my name is uh, Sovit Kharka uh, from New Jersey Institute of Technology. Uh, I'm going to talk about ionospheric plasma bubbles and blobs that is enhancement events occur in the air region ionosphere. So my co-authors are Cesar Valadares from University of Texas at Dallas and Andrew Gerard from New Jersey Institute of Technology. So ionosphere uh, is not actually a distinct layer. Actually, it is uh, some part of, it covers some part of major sphere and most of the part of uh, uh, thermal sphere. So, but it has a strong uh, evidence, abundance of uh, plasma particles. So a small perturbation in the plasma density cause uh, severe radio signal disrupt disruption and failure of many modern technological devices uh, related to communication and navigation system. So plasma bubbles are actually depleted uh, plasma region, plasma density region, and plasma uh, blobs are the enhanced uh, plasma density region in the ionosphere. So this study mainly presents uh, the various ionosphere parameters of equatorial F region ionosphere in the various uh, uh, characteristics of irregularities are uh, seen in uh, equatorial plasma bubble EPBs and blob by two uh, techniques. One is ground based with a GPS receiver data and uh, Langmuir, Langmuir probe uh, uh, is uh, the data taken from SWAM satellite. So this is uh, the uh, Depletion. So these two plots, figure 1a, the upper and lower plot, we can see that uh, the x-axis, uh, y-axis in the top plot. So y-axis is the density and the y uh, axis in the upper uh, plot is uh, universal time and lower is magnetic latitude. We can see clear depletion of plasma density here. So, so we will see how the GPS re receiver from ground uh, response with this detection and similarly uh, this is uh, another uh, this uh, figure 1b that also showing the enhancement of density enhancement of density and uh, like in the magnetic latitude we can see around 20 degrees so usually the depletion uh, enhancement that is plasma blo blobs is seen uh, away from the magnetic equator around 20 degree in this case so for this analysis, uh, I used to, uh, I already uh, mentioned that I used two data uh, set, uh, source uh, that is SWAM and GPS, GPS receiver like a SWAM. SWAM is a constellation of this uh, satellite. Uh, it is uh, the satellite pair like uh, two, two satellites flying side by side uh, with uh, around 1.5 degree long interval separation and third one is uh, little bit higher than that altitude, like 550 uh, altitude in initial altitude. This SWAM satellite was launched in uh, November 22nd, 2013. And this uh, analysis mainly covers a very early data set, like from 2013. And this is a GPS uh, receivers from South America. This uh, uh, blue circle is uh, uh, GPS related to uh, listen nature that is low latitude ionospheric sensor nature and other uh, GPS receiver even extending this uh, to Central America. So I'm going to show the a few events. Like this is a plasma uh, uh, bubble events seen by uh, SWAM satellites. We can see that around 407, 407 UT to 409 UT, we can see clear depletion of density from uh, then that of background uh, electro uh, plasma density. So we can you see- You got five, five minutes, five minutes left. Plasma density is depleted here. And during that time, the satellite is flying uh, 
around this region. So the bubbles are elongated along uh, magnetic field line and the uh, trajectory of swarm is like this. So the, they are recording this one, this region, this region, uh, depleted region. Mm -hmm. So how this uh, GPS receiver uh, sees that uh, phenomena? So uh, in here we can see that around 407 to 409, so I plotted here uh, seven hours from 00 UT to 06 UT hours. And we can see that the satellite sees uh, the depletion around 4 UT, but the distortion of PEC uh, seen in the uh, uh, northern crest of equatorial ionization anomaly started at 2 UT and it, uh, it remains uh, uh, here till 6 UT. So GPS receiver sees even earlier than the snapshot taken by satellite and, and even after that uh, uh, observations uh, by uh, swarm satellite. So during that time, we can see zero to around five UT, there is a high uh, S4 index. S4 index is the quantitative measurement of uh, ionospheric uh, irregularities. So another event, I'm going to, so another event that is plasma blobs event. This is a high density around 15, uh, 3, oh, 16 to around 3, oh, uh, 3, 16 UT to 3, 18 UT, we can say enhanced uh, plasma density. And during that time, the satellite path is around in Caribbean region. So uh, sim in similar to previous uh, analysis, I also use GPS TC data. So we can see that, and here we can see this around uh, 3, 16. So, in uh, so we can see uh, if we see here in the uh, crest region every hour in each and every hours so like we can see the there is a decrease in uh, peak height but during uh, this 3 ut we can see the 3 ut peak value is greater than uh, 4 ut uh, uh, value and again after uh, after this 3 uh, 3 UT, we can see that the, the uh, descend, uh, descending part, like descent from its peak creating, uh, creating a solar, it takes longer time to decrease. There is sharp decrease in the 0 and 1 UT, but after 3 UT, you can see it takes a long time to decrease and even the peak is shifted. So for this mechanism, uh, I uh, am showing to, uh, uh, I'm going to show this, uh, uh, how this plasma bubble evolves, like, uh, uh, it is based on relative instability, and there are various sources from the bottom side, like a gravity wave, neutral wind, mainly a vertical wind, neutral wind, uh, plasma uh, uh, polarization electric field that creates a uh, perturbation in the bottom side, and that travels to the high density plasma region, creating a bubble or depleted region that is plasma bubble. And uh, blobs are like this. So when bubbles move up, uh, in uh, and when the um, density gradient decreases and it uh, after that the bubble is start to elongate along field line and pushing the plasma away from the equatorial region and this is the blob we can see here so uh, this is a mainly mechanism and this this is my uh, this is my conclusion and uh, most of the thing already explained here and i, I would say uh, swam only gives us a snapshot of plasma bubble and blobs event, whereas the GPS continuously monitor, monitor this impact. One minute, one minute. Okay. Uh, for the examination of uh, generation to decay mechanism of plasma bubble or blobs events, GPS shall be a better instrument to bring this into uh, practice for uh, coordinated analysis. And Hensai community also mainly are in, involved in the ground based like a radar or INS and observation. So Hamsai community can contribute significantly in this uh, analysis for the forecasting plasma bubble and uh, blobs events, uh, more efficient and cheaper way using cheaper instrument. Thank you very much. If you have question, I'm happy to answer. Okay, thank you uh, uh, very much, uh, Sova. Very interesting. And uh, let's see the uh, next uh, discussion. It's me. Uh, uh, history of antenna technology at the Arecibo Observatory. And uh, uh, I'm Professor Breakall from Penn State uh, University. So let me share the screen here. If we can make this work. Oh, 
Okay, uh, can everybody see that? Yeah. Yep. Okay. And I, uh, what I'd like to do is uh, ask uh, my very close associate and very good friend, uh, Angel, to watch my time here. <laughs> he, I, I don't know how you're going to start with 10 minutes there, Jim. Yeah, we'll he, knows it's a, he knows it's a hard, uh, from knowing me, he knows it's a hard thing. Uh, Let uh, me know when you want to. Uh, track. But I, anyway, he'll do, just give me when you're five minutes and, and like a minute left there, and, and uh, I think it will work. Uh, okay. And so we'll, we also, I should announce that uh, Angel uh, Vasquez uh, is the um, uh, head of telescope operations, RF manager. It's also the ham of the year, but we won't say too much about that with Arecibo, but <laughs> anyway. <laughs> uh, and uh, he, he uh, is in here and probably can help a lot if I get in trouble about describing the observatory. And also, we also have uh, Dana Whitlow is also in IC. And Dana was the chief uh, engineer of Arecibo for many years there and, and is now re retired. So I know he, he could uh, chime in if, if uh, I need help here. Anyway, I've been associated uh, with the observatory for, believe it or not, 47 years. And I'm only 39 years old. So I, I don't know how that, that could be. But anyway. <laughs> Uh, but I, I uh, did start down there as a summer student and uh, uh, been there for many, many years, saw uh, how things have changed over the years. And as uh, a lot of you know, uh, uh, unfortunately, the observatory uh, did collapse there in December. It had other things happen then even uh, further back in, in uh, the, the uh, hurricanes and earthquakes and and so forth, cable snapping. And it's uh, a very sad thing, but uh, the observatory will come back and people are working on that to, to try to see how we can uh, get it back. Okay, so Arecibo, uh, just a very quick introduction here since I, I don't have much time. Uh, it first opened in 63 and uh, uh, it, uh, it looked a lot different back in 63. I'll show some pictures. And then uh, there was a 40th anniversary, and that was in uh, 2003. And then a 50th anniversary, which was in 2013. I uh, was fortunate to be at the, both of those and gave talks there. And then we were hoping in 2023. So. Maybe we'll still have something, I don't know, but uh, it's not gonna be the same without the uh, observatory there. Uh, the observatory, the original- Somebody's concept, making noise on a keyboard. Yeah, some, somebody's typing. Oh yeah, some, if, if you could mute, I guess I could mute everybody too if I had to, but yeah, please uh, mute there if you're uh, typing away. Uh, anyway, uh, hopefully my voice is covering that up. <laughs> uh, Anyway, uh, Professor Gordon, William Gordon, uh, at that time was at Cornell University, later uh, became the provost at Rice University. He was the one that, that thought of this, and it was going to be a, a uh, parabolic dish uh, for the new theory called incoherent scatter radar to measure the ionosphere. And, and the antenna was just going to point straight up and look at scattering from uh, the ionosphere at UHF, and uh, that was gonna be it. So it, it, it turns out at that time, there was work being done at other places uh, uh, with spherical reflectors. And so uh, some people uh, suggested, why don't you use a spherical reflector and then you could move the feed around and, and then it could be used for other uh, scientific purposes such as astronomy and and radar astronomy and things like that. And that was very fortunate that uh, those people uh, came forward. And so the Arecibo has been at the forefront of science and astronomy, uh, radio astronomy, planetary radar, and ionospheric probing, and also uh, optical probing, and also HF heating like the facility that's uh, behind me here. I'm not really here right now, but that's, uh, I have been there and I'm going there in May actually, a uh, harp facility in, in Alaska. So let's see here. Uh, 
Okay, so there's the original picture of the dish. I know it looks really small probably, but it was just a chicken wire mesh, okay? And, and so uh, it didn't really go, uh, you know, much above uh, uh, 600 megahertz or so. And we'll get into more things. Uh, because it's a spherical uh, dish, it had to have what are called line feeds at that time. And so th the waves don't focus to a single point like a parabolic dish, they focus to a line. And so the line uh, for uh, 430 megahertz, had, and to get the whole dish, it's really at, at all frequencies that you'd have the same line. Uh, the uh, uh, length of this had to be about a, a 96 feet, okay? And this is the thing that broke off in, in uh, Hurricane uh, Maria there. It, it just broke off and there was only a little bit of this left. But anyway, this is basically a leaky waveguide with many slots going around. And uh, it was uh, designed mainly by Alan Love, a very famous antenna person, a uh, great engineer. And this was at 430 megahertz and it had 61 dBi of gain. Now there were other feeds before this that didn't Five work. minutes, Jim. Yep, okay, got it. And, and, and so uh, this one really got the efficiency up and, and got 61 dBi of gain. That's like over a million times of power gain. So one watt is equivalent to over a million watts effective radiated power, okay? Also in the 1970s, there was an upgrade where the chicken wire uh, mesh was replaced with uh, panels. And uh, the panels were three by six foot with little tiny holes in them. So the sunlight would go through and prevent erosion uh, below the dish because uh, the, all these panels are actually suspended by cables above the surface underneath. And uh, there was a big uh, program uh, using photo, uh, uh, photog let's see, I can't pronounce it. Dana knows what this is. <laughs> uh, photogram. Metry, I guess, yeah. Photogrammetry, I think. Okay, I'm glad you can pronounce it. <laughs> You're the one that told me about it. <laughs> and Use it the autolite. <laughs> it, got, it got the dish to two and a half millimeters, which means that it could work up to 10 gigahertz, okay? Let's get off here. And then later on uh, uh, in the 1990s, there was another upgrade. This was a substantial upgrade in that the uh, uh, they put this uh, uh, count, uh, this Gregorian reflecting system with two dishes in here, two mirrors that could bring everything to a single point. And then uh, there was a rotary floor that had many feeds and you could just rotate the feeds around to get the different frequencies. And they mainly use feed horns for that. They also then had the line feed that had the 430 megahertz, two and a half megawatt radar. And they could also uh, bring uh, the power over to the Gregorian or split the power so they could do dual beam experiments. Also, there was an S-band one megawatt CW transmitter in there uh, for planetary radar. And you can see how all the rays, if you do the ray tracing. If you wanna see more of this, click on this movie. And this is uh, Angel and uh, Val, NV9L, uh, that had a Ham Nation uh, video. And uh, Angel does a lot of talking in here with Val, and it's it's really a great a great watch there. So please, if you're coming into this talk, please put this movie on, and uh, you you'll love it. Uh, okay, guess I'm covering this up over here. But the other part of Arecibo is ionospheric heating. Originally, there was a great big field of 32 log periodics. This is what mainly I worked on. I did work on some of the feeds in the Gregorian, but I worked mainly on this. And then later, uh, this got destroyed by uh, Hurricane uh, George's in 1998. And later we, we built an array at the bottom of the dish, a triangular array across dipoles that fed a, a mesh. A mesh was up above the dish here and it acted like a Cassegrain reflector. And uh, there were uh, six uh, 100 kilowatt transmitters right here. Be great for uh, Angel's future uh, multi-multi uh, ham radio station there. But uh, anyway, uh, that, uh, that, that thing worked great. And uh, uh, the, the mesh was a frequency selective surface 
uh, so that the 430 megahertz, well, 300 megahertz and up all for astronomy and uh, the uh, S-band would go right through the mesh, but the lower frequencies at uh, 5 megahertz and 8 megahertz uh, would uh, be reflected off the mesh. One so uh, anyway, uh, it, it, as you know, uh, and I'm not going to show the movie, I just took a snapshot. Some of us uh, don't like to see this, okay, that have been associated with the place. I should mention Angel and I have known each other for 44 of those 47 years. So I met Angel on the first day on the job there, which was a memorable uh, location, but better off for a a time uh, at a pub there with uh, an adult <laughs> beverage to talk about that. Okay, as you know, the dish got destroyed. The platform came down. Some of my dipoles still stayed up, okay? So we may be able to still use some of those if we can patch up the dish with some chicken wire again, go back to the chicken wire, and, uh, and maybe even there's ideas of putting a like a uh, a cam uh, like a sky cam you see at the football stadium on cables and move it around and we can probably put a feed up there. There's also ideas of putting a 430 uh, horn at the bottom with another sub reflector. Time's get it up, Professor. Get her back. Okay, so that's that's pretty much it. I'm I'm pretty much uh, done there. And uh, uh, as Angel knows, I could uh, I could go on for a couple more hours. Uh, with 47 years at the observatory. Uh, so anyway, I hope you'll enjoy this uh, presentation. And, uh, and uh, that's, that's about it. So let me stop sharing here. Okay. And uh, let, let me move on to the next one, uh, which is uh, uh, Introduction to Field Programmable Gate Arrays, FPGAs. They're used in everything. And that's going to be by uh, uh, the uh, moderator, Wong. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. And from the University of uh, Scranton. And uh, please go ahead. I'll let you know when you have uh, five minutes. Uh, thank you. Uh, so uh, my name is Gung Nguyen. I'm, I'm a student from Vietnam. I'm currently uh, participating in uh, at the University of Scranton, and I'm going to give you a very brief introduction to uh, FPGAs, the few programmable gate arrays. It's very brief because there's a lot we can talk about with FPGAs, and, and as, as Jim said, it is used in every industry. So first, let's talk about the history of the FPGAs. So what the picture is that the picture that you are seeing here is the first FPGA, is the Sidelink XC2064. Um, the FPGAs are generic programmable logic devices uh, whose structures are completely configurable after the manufacturing process. So it grew out of the demand for a uh, more general purpose but complex logic system. So instead of having to design you know, a, a logic circuit from discrete uh, logic chips, you can just reprogram this FPGA chip to perform different tasks. Um, so it evolved from uh, multiple uh, programmable logic devices of this time, so including the you know, read-only memory, programmable array logic, PAL, and uh, programmable logic array. Those two very, sound very similar, but they are actually two different uh, technologies. So, oh, sorry about that. Let me mute that. Okay. Okay, so uh, the FPJ was invented by uh, Mr. Frost Freeman, Ross Freeman, who uh, co-founded Siling in 1984. Um, Unfortunately, he passed away just five years after inventing the device, but the device, you know, paved the way for one of the multi-billionaire industry and uh, one of the most popular and most used chip of, of today. And thanks to the, its importance, this FPGA XC2064 is actually included 
and it's one of the 33 chips in the in the AAA chip chip hall of fame so that's roughly the history of the fpga and now let's talk about the structures or the features of the fpga so the picture that you're seeing here this is one of the images included in the patent that selling submitted for their first fpga chip so most fpga well actually i would say all fpga include uh, configurable logic blocks which are the the blue rectangles here and the interconnects which are the wires around it and the uh, the configurable io pads around it so as you can see you have these uh, diagonal lines here on the interconnects so by turning on and off these switches you can reroute the io to their respective uh, logic blocks um nowadays this schematic is much more complex because instead of just using switches, now we have uh, switch matrices, which is really complicated than just turning something on and off. And uh, most FPGAs nowadays actually have uh, onboard, uh, let's see, uh, combinat combinatorial elements, flip flops, multiplexers, uh, lookup tables. It might also have uh, onboard memory because the FPGA is program is volatile. That means that after a power off, the entire data will be destroyed. So by using five, an onboard- Five minutes, uh, Quora, five minutes. Oh, thank you. Um, by using onboard memory, after you turn it back on again, it will simply load the program from the onboard memory into the chip itself. And, uh, this picture you're seeing here is one of the example of what a program logic block looks like. So this is a, this looks like a a three bit adder. Very simple one. You have uh, we have oh, I think tables. You froze. Oh, you're back. Oh, okay. Um, so you can see that we have some lookup tables here, multiplexers, a D flip flop and synchronize with the clock. And so this, usually for developers, we, and we don't concern ourselves with uh, how, how the FEJ actually works, but usually what we care about is what happens down here. So we program the board, the FEJ chips, we program them usually with very log or VHDL. So those are hardware description languages. And it's important to note that uh, HDLs, are not programming languages. Programming languages are highly abstract computer languages, but HDL, they, they just do exactly what their name implies. They simply describe what the hardware looks like. So this is an example of code. Um, so that's how it works. And next, let's talk about the applications of it. Um, here are some of the advantages of the FPGA. Because of its programmability, the chip can simply be uh, programmed by, by any user after it's being manufactured. So instead of having to design a chip and then send it to the manufacturer to print it, and then you know, design another one for another project, you can simply use the same one and design it the way that you want, uh, which means that it reduces the cost of the, the project. And it's also have a great portability because it's not included with any software. So as long as you you know match up the inputs and the outputs, it should be good in any system. And uh, FPJ is a real time chip, so it's, it's not translating inputs and output into instructions like the regular processors do. They simply take the input and produce the output right away. And uh, because of its programmability, it, you can design it the way that you want. It can be parallelized massively but also it has other disadvantages like uh, very high power consumption um, high cost to mass produce it might be better to produce one at a time but if a manufacturer is to produce many at a time then it will be cheaper to actually produce the, the regular general purpose processors and as I, ta I told you the volatility the program can destroy after the power off and even though it can boot from a, a normal memory 
it still takes a longer time to boot than a regular processor. And here are some of the usages of the of the FPGAs. The most notable one for us will be the data processing. So uh, I'm pretty sure Scott is working on the Chan Tangerine SDR, and uh, FPJ is the uh, the platform of the data engine. And there are some other new fields, as uh, for example, artificial intelligence. There are research, there are a few research going on about integrating uh, AI and FPGAs because of uh, the multi the multiple large and repeated calculation of uh, machine learning and the ability of FPGA to be uh, parallelized. And over here, this is one of the examples. One minute, one minute left. Um, this is one of the development boards for the FPGA. In the middle here is the actual FPGA chip. This is the uh, Altera Max 10. Uh, it has some notable features, like it has more than 50,000 logic elements, three, 360 pins, 200 megabytes of memory, and all of this. It has three internal clocks, and uh, most notably, it has a very affordable price of $85. In fact, the program used for, to program the first assigning chip is actually cost $12,000. So obviously, that wouldn't be affordable for any uh, individual developers. And down here are some very uh, simple simple demonstrations of the FHA power. This is a very, very simple line follower. It's using a com counter and a comparator to generate the PWM signal to control the motors. It's Try to finish uh, quickly there, Juan. Yep, that's it. Yep. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, yeah, FPGAs are just amazing uh, uh, things there. Okay, our, uh, our next uh, talk is uh, SMART. That's capital S M A R T, all capital ground based magnetometer array initial look, and it's by uh, Noel at uh, Augsburg University, and it's not Augsburg, Germany, I don't think. Uh, go ahead, uh, Noel, no. and I'll tell you. Yeah, five no, minutes. They they stole our name. Uh, <laughs> yeah, welcome. Uh, Smart is the result of an array of magnetometers that are about ten years old. I'll bring up this picture here. This picture you may have seen before. It is the merging of a number of different ground-based magnetometer arrays. The purple ones down the middle uh, of North America make up SMART. They are flex gate magnetometers, which means they have a, a device measured in the ground which uh, uses the magnetic field to control a bias field that zeroes it out. They are reasonably sensitive. Uh, they are the installation runs a few thousand dollars, so they're a bit they're a bit expensive. Of these smarts that you see, these have all been uh, shut down except the one you will see today. Uh, they have started with a PC, a desktop PC, and are now being converted over to another uh, another magnetometer technology. Let's see if I can get you. The technology that we're using is a little tricky. Uh, is uh, based on the Raspberry Pi. Uh, we appreciate FPGAs. Uh, they will be in the museum pretty soon because microcomputers have gotten to the point where uh, they're pro fully programmable. The advantage here is a very simple system. Lower left-hand corner is a magnetometer that's buried in the ground. That is the only expense of this system. It has a power supply that it's connected to and that data then flows into the Raspberry Pi. The Raspberry Pi can send its data out via Ethernet or Wi-Fi, or you can take a thumb drive, plug it into the Raspberry Pi, and just have it store the data. This is designed uh, so that it's simple and inexpensive, and we want the local users to be able to see the data. Uh, most of these sites for the smart array are buried in the ground near a university or college or in some cases some high schools. Uh, the Raspberry Pi now is running eight, nine, ten years old and uh, it has gotten uh, to the point where it is uh, running fairly sophisticated programs and supports just about uh, any any external device. 
Um, so what, what I'd really like to emphasize is the data. Uh, this may be a little invisible in your, on your screen, but please look at this page uh, to start with. I will go and bring up other, uh, I'll, I'll bring up the, the real data. Okay, so the, the point of this is the Raspberry Pi, and this is just a single Raspberry Pi, is watching a number of different sensors. Uh, the sensors, some of them are in the ground, some of them are just sitting on top of the ground. Uh, winter is just about over in Minnesota, so we can finally go to uh, bury some of these devices. Uh, we'll first look at what the real magnetometer looks like. Oh, I get rid of that. Oh man, this is going to be a challenge because I have, because of the control there, I got the control box out of the way. So here is live data from my page. You can get to this live data. This is a search coil magnetometer, like say a few thousand dollars worth of investment. Uh, X, Y, and Z magnetic field are in nano Tesla. And uh, this magnetometer has been in the ground for about 10 years. Uh, you notice the scale on the side. Uh, each division is 10 or 20. I think there, today it's all 20 nano Tesla. So that the range of motion of the magnetic fields of the Earth that you're sensitive to is typically on the order of 100 nano Tesla. So this sensor is buried in the ground. It is heated. You can notice the temperature uh, scale on the lower right hand corner. Uh, these sensors are very sensitive to temperature. So we keep them uh, heated well above the surrounding temperature. Uh, this one is buried uh, down the hill. Uh, it's about 50 feet from the house. But it is sensitive enough such that when the tr pickup truck next door leaves, uh, the pickup truck, uh, I can tell that they're gone. I don't have to look out the window. Uh, the magnetic field here in the Minnesota is perfect, by the way, in case you have any questions. Uh, we are lined up almost exactly north magnetic and north geographic is lined up. You can see that the Y field, which is the east-west field, is nearly zero. It's only a thousand uh, nanotesla. So that makes it really easy to line up uh, our sensors uh, with the magnetic uh, declination, correct. I'm having a challenge here because my click through is behind these things. Okay, so this, uh, if you keep these uh, items in mind, sort of keep this picture in your mind. And luckily enough, this detector it measured, let me get that out of here, measured a disturb- Five minutes, five minutes. Yep, Measured a disturbance in the magnetosphere uh, from about uh, 12 a.m. to uh, about 7 a.m., so eight hours. So we have uh, we had a storm, and here's our storm. Uh, we got a K of six, and then five, six, about three in the morning, at, and five at about nine in the morning. And so we are actually able to measure with uh, the flux gate. Now the question we have asked: these will be as re reinstalled and put up online, and you'll be able to see those. So the question we ask can we use a low cost magnetometer to see the same thing? And uh, last, yesterday morning, uh, uh, Dave Witten and presented uh, uh, the RM3100, which is a search, which is a coil magnetometer, fairly cleverly built magnetometer. And this is one of those data, this is actually called a 9100, but they're all the same. Um, it is located in a physical box to protect it. Once you set something outside, that's what you need. And you notice that this one has a, uh, has a pretty good uh, disturbance from about midnight to about seven o'clock. The noise on this one is about 10 nanotesla. So it is sensitive to moderate, to moderate magnetic disturbances. In addition, we have uh, other detectors. Um, let me go back and show you some of the other less expensive detectors, which we've tried out. And these detectors are typically magneto resistive. That is, they have a resistor bank that measures uh, the change in resistance on, uh, based on the magnetic field. And this is their data. We can bring it up, here we go. And these are a little deceiving. This is just a temperature scale. They're, they're lost, if you look at the, X scale, you notice that the noise there is about 100 nanotesla. So the noise on the LM3100 
LSM 303 is about what we need to measure to see uh, disturbances. And the, uh, uh, the LIS 3 MDL, which is another magnetic detector, it has just about the same amount of noise. So if we have large excursions, you may see that. So the system, let me go back here to where I can get to it. So the system of a simple Raspberry Pi and a in-ground uh, RM3100 magnetometer is possible. We will be reinstalling those. And this array will be available. Uh, uh, it, we fit it to a cloud now that's run by Adafruit, and it'll also be available up on the Google Cloud. So that, that is our initial report of what we're going to do with these detectors. And if there's any questions, be happy to answer. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, we're, we actually uh, have a, 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 about a, a couple minutes. If, if somebody does have a quick question, uh, uh, we have a couple minutes left here. Or if you and want if you, to say anything more, uh, I'll go ahead. Right, if you go to, go to my poster and go to the lower right-hand corner, uh, go to this page here, if I can get this thing to come back up. Yeah, you got about three minutes left if you want. Yeah, yeah, well, the actually online data, oh, I see, I'm not in the preview mode, am I? I'm sorry. Uh, if you want to see the actual online data, uh, this is live. Uh, this getting back to the poster seems to be pretty slow today. I think we're all we're all <laughs> bouncing around on posters. But if you want to go to go to the lower right hand page uh, on my poster, see now you get to see the little lamb. You got about the, a minute here. Right, and the lower right hand corner there are links to the live data as well as to our smartmagnet.org website where all that data will be linked. Wow, that is slow, huh? <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I know. I, 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 uh, can you hear me now? Sure. Yeah, my question had to do with how you are uh, processing or how you are collecting specifically the RM3100 data. Uh, you know that it does have onboard averaging capability, which substantially reduces the signal to noise ratio for one per second uh, samples. Right. With these, are, uh, this is a one minute average. Okay, well, in my one minute averages, I've seen basically plus or minus no more than plus or minus 2.5 nano, nano Tesla noise. Right. Uh, this one <laughs> is we have snow here in Minnesota, and that snow makes big piles next to the driveway, and I couldn't get it uh, I, under the deck until just a couple days ago. And so this one will have to be buried and put down on the ground, and you can see that it is very quiet. Yeah, they are, and uh, amazingly so, actually. All right, how many cycles are you running at? 400, 600, 800? Oh, you mean how many sample cycles? In other words, the, the, you have two variables you can set. One is the cycle count, yep. and the other is the average. Uh, I think they're both uh, at uh, 200. Okay, if you um, move, if you use, you'll do much better if you go to 400 uh, or 600 or even 800. I'm running 800. Yep. and uh, 30 averages. Right, we, this is actually a, a WIT Motion 901, which is the RM9100 or 3100 buried inside of a box. Right, well, mine, mine are buried uh, at 20 yep. inches below the soil. Well, you saw the presentation yesterday. Right, yes, I did, and yeah, it's, it's, the, it's, the, uh, it's the PNI, which is, and PNI is the original manufacturer. WIT Motion right. gets them from PNI, yep. Okay, right, yeah. excuse me. Uh, we're we're going to have to move on. I hate to interrupt uh, this great discussion, but I guess you can continue in the room there. And uh, looks like yeah, Dave, I'm going to hang around at the end of the room, and we can talk about it. Sure. Yeah. Thanks. See you later. Sounds, sounds great. Okay, so uh, please uh, stop sharing the screen there. Yep, we're good. And uh, our next uh, talk is. Uh, titled The Sun and the Earthquakes. I don't know if Angel uh, wants to hear about this down in, in uh, Arecibo, but uh, it's by Edmondo uh, Independent. Uh, uh, please go ahead, Edmondo, and we'll tell you when you have five minutes left. Is Edmondo in here? Anybody see him? I, I don't have participants up. 
Yeah, it seems like he's not in this uh, breakout room. Oh, okay. He's probably, he probably got lost <laughs> on his way to the room here. So, uh, okay. Well, with that, uh, we'll move on. If he shows up, we can put him in at the end. And uh, the next one is uh, WW0WWV. A lot of W's. Uh, it's a WWV Amateur Radio Club. Uh, we're very interested to hear this uh, from uh, Dave at WW0WWV. Uh, uh, go ahead, Dave, and I'll tell you when you have five minutes. Okay, very good. Well, hello, all. Happy first day of spring. A little over eight hours into it. And uh, looking outside, our two foot snowfall that we had last weekend is down about eight inches already, which is very welcome because. There's more snow coming to the Rockies tomorrow, so that's springtime in the Rockies, unfortunately. Can you guys see uh, my screen over here? Uh, yes, it's, it's, uh, it's up there where it says click here to view iPosters. Okay, poster. my poster's way at the bottom down in the corner, so it's easy to find. And so there you go. So I'm Dave Swartz, W0DAS. I'm the newly elected uh, president of the WWV Amateur Radio Club, and my poster is a mix of four different themes. Uh, where the club is now in the first column over here on the left, uh, how the club came to form and an overview of the people and the activities involved when we put together the 100th anniversary a year and a half ago. Uh, the impressions of WWB, how uh, it got someone involved in ham radio and uh, came back and, and uh, uh, his story, which I think is kind of neat. And then um, most recently, we've uh, had some great interactions with uh, NIST. And so uh, there's a column over here to fill you in a little bit about what's going on there. Uh, and the first column, take a look over here, is just a quick uh, update on our club. We have, we were originally formed to uh, support the 100th anniversary. And after the event and uh, even mailing out a thousand QSL cards, exhaustion and in life reality set in and we didn't uh, end up meeting anymore that fall. Uh, and very quickly, 2020 came along, COVID, you know the rest of the story. It was very difficult to get us all back together again and, uh, and get focused on anything uh, along the lines of the club. But uh, we've done that recently and we are newly formed. And so if you scroll on down, you can read about that. Oh, this is kind of fun. That's a, a, a bumper sticker that we put together for the event. I and mean, we still give those out. We send out a bumper sticker to everybody. And uh, Matt Deutsch at the radio station at WWB uh, plopped it right on top of the WWB B time controller. And so it's kind of a fun little story behind that, too. But anyhow, go ahead and take a look. And at the very bottom is a link to our website. I won't go there now. But uh, we are just getting our act together. We uh, formed our club officially with new bylaws and constitution uh, just last week. So I'm the newly elected president and other members in the group as well. The second column is just a review of what happened uh, leading up to and uh, getting us uh, onto the property with NIST and working with them. It was a challenge. We had all kinds of things to face as a resort, as a result, uh, but it was a lot of fun. And uh, please cruise through that. One of my fun things I included on here is just a link way down towards the bottom. But uh, one of our hands, uh, Kevin, uh, N7GES, uh, got to record an announcement for WWV and about the special event station. So it's kind of neat to take a listen to that if you get a chance. The third column is a story written uh, by Fred Schwarzke, W9KEY, that originally appeared in the West Mountain Radio Quarterly Bulletin back in the fourth quarter of 2019. Fred is a fairly new ham who got turned on to WWB on a rare tour in 2017, and he became a ham and was one of the most enthusiastic participants uh, when he came back uh, to take part in the uh, anniversary celebration. And I think the fourth column is probably going to be the most interesting to people, uh, connecting with NIST. Um, recently, David Kasdan and I wrote to NIST, and to make a long story short, we opened up a dialogue with them. And they've invited uh, Phil Erickson and Steve Serwin to present to the Time and Frequency Division this coming Thursday. Uh, it's at uh, 1600 UTC up to 1730. So here in Colorado, 10 a.m. to 1130. Uh, AM on Thursday, and they're going to educate the time and frequency division about HAMSI and what HAMSI is up to. And this opens up some exciting possibilities, and so you can read about that in that column. There's also an update on uh, 
the changes that are going on at the radio station itself, WWB, WVB. And the updates are really to VB, and so maybe not as a much interest to the HF crowd, but certainly an important part of our infrastructure. So they're going to be replacing this device over here called the Matrix Switch, which is a physical switch right now, and you can read about that. Also doing updates to their variometer. This is a massive uh, inductor that has a, a motor that uh, rotates another uh, coil inside and can change the tuning. Uh, especially useful for low frequency, and so 60 kilohertz signal coming out from there. There's a great quick story that I put together about the storm that hit us and the fact that WWV went off the air and that Matt Deutsch and Glenn uh, Nelson, uh, both employees of the, of the uh, station in Hams, ended up going up there in the middle of a blizzard to restart WWVB. And so you can take a look at that. All right, that's about it. And... Uh, Thanks so much for uh, tuning in, and I'll be around to uh, answer questions a little bit later on. Oh, very good. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Dave. We actually have about uh, five minutes left. Uh, if, if anybody has any comments or questions right now, uh, please go ahead. How do you get one of those cool bumper stickers? Oh, well, you have to work us on the air. <laughs> so we'll be. Uh, that's one of the things we're open to do with the club is to have uh, more on-air activities. The, the number of hams that really connect with WWB is amazing. And, um, you know, whether they were military service in Vietnam and flying back, um, you know, hearing that signal all over the world uh, helped a lot of the military feel connected to back home. It's kind of a cool story that we learned as we were talking to people and, and uh, getting connected. So it's very neat. There, there was uh... The, the word about shutting down WWV, you know, a while back. Uh, can you go into that, Annie? And, and, and uh, what, it, what is the future, do you think? Well, I think the, there was a, a threat in 2017 it was talked about, but really I think the one in 2018 caught people's attention. It was in the middle of the summer, and um, there was quite a, a discussion on QRZ, and, and good reasons for shutting it down and reasons against it and everything. But... Uh, a few hands like myself, we have a lot of connection to it. We feel, you know, I, I, I got into radio because of WWB as an eight-year-old listening to that on a shortwave radio and going, what is this? This is amazing. And so a lot of people have a, an emotional connection to WWB. It's very interesting. And uh, a lot of people came out and, and showed up for it. And, of course, the ham side community has a real strong interest in having WWB stay on the air. And so this is an opportunity to uh, – uh, bring all of that together. And so uh, David Kasdan and the Case Western uh, Reserve crew came out and took part, ran the, uh, freak, the Festival of Frequency Measurement as part of the event as well. Um, I mean, it was, it was a, a really good turnout and it was a really good launch for uh, Christina's efforts there. And so um, the whole event was just a lot of fun. Well, that's great. Uh, now, the, uh, the announcer on WWV, I imagine there must be some real history on that uh, gentleman, and and uh, do you, do you have any uh, history on uh, the announcer? That's a really good question. I you know I don't know who that individual was. I know it was recorded. Oh, back in the uh, in the uh, 80s or 70s, and they've had to update it a couple times. I don't think he's alive anymore. Of course, it's all you know uh, mechanically uh, synthesized or, or recorded that way. Um, but it's a uh, yeah, that's probably a very good story. I think at the NIST website, if you go to that to that particular uh, uh, spot, and I don't know if um, I'm still screen showing here, but if you go to the end of Fred's uh, story down here, yeah, you could really... you could share you could share the screen again if you want. Click share Oops, screen. Was. There we go. If you go down to the bottom of the uh, third story here, so if you go ahead and and follow this guy and go to the very bottom. Fred's story's got a couple links to some good history papers, and then also a technical paper written uh, by Glenn Nelson. Glenn is one of the uh, four employees up at the, at the uh, at WWV, and he is a, a recent ham as well, because we came along and uh, 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 we're having the 100th, 100th anniversary. He, he, he decided to get into ham radio. He sat down and in one test session went from uh, no license to extra. Uh, makes sense for someone working at a radio station, but uh, he's really excited about it and has gotten back into it. 
and uh, wrote a great history for the uh, for the event. So you can link to it from uh, from that particular page. Okay, thank you uh, very much, there, Dave. Let, let me just see here if uh, the one we missed, uh, the sun and the earthquakes, uh, Ed, Edmondo. Uh, I wonder if he is in. Is Edmondo? Are you in? I, I, I didn't see. I didn't see his poster in the poster gallery either. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah maybe. Yeah, maybe something to, happened. Uh, do you know? To, I just checked his Dr. Rizal, and it seems like uh, Edmondo dropped out. Okay. Very yeah. good. Well, I I think we've uh, come to the end here. I hope I didn't miss anybody. <laughs> And uh, I guess at this point, uh, maybe Kwong knows more too, or anybody here. I guess I guess uh, uh, the in the you know the the individuals us that have posters can go find an open room, and open that room up. And uh, I guess the rest can stay here or try to find rooms. I I guess that's what we're uh, supposed to do. So, uh, do you have any uh, final comments there, Kwong, as a moderator? Um, no, I think uh, we are good as long as the the I poster are concerned now. So it's totally open for open discussion now. Okay, so are we are we not supposed to go and and uh, go into individual rooms with our uh, each of us that are given posters? You're saying we're supposed to stay here? Um, no, we are. Feel free to you know leave the room. Yeah. It, okay. Yeah. After you done yeah. with the poster. Jim, maybe you can keep tabs on. Uh, if, are you going to stay in this room? And if you are, well, I, I I was thinking I would go get my own room. <laughs> oh, well, that's true. You got your own room. Who's the moderator? That that the moderator is Kwong. Cool. Yeah, I'm the moderator. So, so you, Kwong, maybe maybe we find a room and we come and back here and tell you that we found a room, and if people come looking for us, you can tell them where we are. Oh, yeah. I was just gonna. I'm, yeah. I'm just gonna click the breakout rooms now. Let me see if there's any empty here. Uh, well, there's there's currently there's currently the fifty room. there's currently fifty total rooms. So. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, there's a lot of rooms empty here. I I was hoping I'd find room seventy three. It sort of goes along with ham radio, but yeah. I don't see seventy three there. So, but there's a lot of rooms open. So I I I think the idea is is that each of the the poster people here that are presenting should go find a room and then your name will show and and i i guess that's uh, uh the way it's supposed to work does that sound right Juan, yep, exactly. yep. okay right. uh jim that that sounds weird to me you want to stay where we are well we could yeah i guess and uh, the only thing is uh well i guess you're right uh, people that are looking for our individual posters uh I guess would know we're still in here. I, I don't know. It, it wasn't real clear to me how that was going to work. You know, the, the only thing is if somebody was looking for our names, then it's not going to show up. It just shows up as, as room five. So that's why I think you might be better to go get your own room. If you're a poster presenter. I, your, your name does show up on, on the list. So. Yeah, that's true. It does. I guess it does show that we're still here. So mm -hmm. I don't know. I don't think that was the uh, the intent. I, I think we were supposed to go get it. But I yeah, I, I'm OK with staying here. <laughs> I don't know. You're going to be here three hours. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's true. What What do you all think? Uh, as I'm going to stay here. I'll, I'll stay. OK. Uh, yep. Yeah, same here. Since, since we're on the schedule, uh, I have to have Dave Schwartz. Do you leave yet? No, I'm here. Okay, is WWV for or against leap seconds and years and hours and minutes? <laughs> let's do uh, contra uh, let's have some controversy. <laughs> <laughs> Just what I need. My first week as president, right? Um, no, I um, I was thinking of actually going to another room. I was going to go to room twenty five, and if we tell uh, 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 Kwang uh, where we are, uh, maybe we could have a conversation there. The problem is right now we've got like 50 people all gathered in the same spot hearing only one yeah. person talk. And yeah, that's I, I, not really how poster sessions work. Right, so, I think you're right. I, I think what we should do is each one of us go get a room and that'll be your room and then and then you can come back, I, I guess, and tell 
long. I, I don't know if you'll lose the room when you leave, but uh, probably that quick you won't, I, I would think. Well, maybe Kwong could be the director so that people come looking for our posters. They're going to come to the room, you know, this, this session, poster session. That's five. true. Kwong, if, if you, once we leave, okay, the ones that have posters, mm -hmm. uh, of course, you have a poster too, so you, you might as well stay in here and be your room. Uh, but once we leave, if you could, uh, you know, give a search, you know, just click the uh, breakout rooms and then and then anybody that comes in that's looking for us, if they say, hey, I was looking for Dave, you know, uh, uh, you could tell them what room number. You could write it down on a sheet of paper or something. Yeah. So it's going to be just either me or the, the, the person, you know, going to track track the, the poster presenter down on the list. Yeah. yeah. It seems like somebody has to do that, unfortunately. Yeah, I, I got it. I got it. <laughs> Well, I'm going to go to room 25, 25 megahertz. It's an experimental. Oh, that's perfect. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And uh, anybody wants to come and talk about WWV, Amateur Radio Club, or anything <laughs> WWV, I'll be over there. And it's nice okay. to meet you all. Happy spring. Yeah, thank you, Dave. And uh, nice thank to meet you. you. I'm going to go to room 39. That's, uh, that's my age, as I said. So uh, <laughs> 39 will be my room. Was that the best 10 years of your life? <laughs> <laughs> no, I hope the next uh, 39 years. <laughs> no, are you well, going to say if you're 39? I'll comment that you don't look a year over 47. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, who is talking to me? Is that you, Dave? No, this is Jules. Jules, okay, yes, I'm going to stay here, Jules. I uh, the the problem is once the, everybody sever, separates out, it's hard to find people on that list. True. Yeah. Uh, yes. Yeah, uh, so. The, our primary work has been to get our uh, Falcon magnetometer running and uh, get that data. Originally, we were using a cloud at uh, UCLA, and UCLA decided they didn't want to be cloud servers anymore. So now we're using Adafruit. I don't know if you've used their cloud at all. No, I haven't. I was wondering how to join your network because my, my installation is quite stable. It's uh, 400 feet out from the house in a wood lot. Uh, very, very isolated in terms of uh, local noise. Right, yeah, I heard about your challenges of getting wires out. Uh, luckily enough, I have power all the way down to the lake. <laughs> mm -hmm. 